Hi Mike, as Dominic has said, and what I wanted to talk with, uh, to you about is uh, the different audiences of science communication. I thought before I do that, I'll give you a short introduction of the kind of research that we do more generally at the University of Zurich in science communication. So uh, the, the basic roadmap, the structure of the talk is going to be like this. I'll give you as a short introduction this overview over the research topics that we do, that we have. And then it's going to be the talk about the different audiences of science communication. That's going to be structured very classically, the conceptual framework, the actual approach that we use, methods, results, etc., etc. And then hopefully there's still going to be time for Q&A. Um, that's uh, that's the, the, the science communication research team at the University of Zurich. And I, I wanted to show you this for two reasons. First, because some of the names you're going to see on the next slides and some of the names that are associated with the, the project from different audiences of science communication are the people that you can see there, like Tobias Friesen and others. And the other reason is I wanted to show you implicitly that's a picture from our last team retreat in January. It's beautiful in Switzerland. If you ever want to come and do research on science communication in, in Zurich or in Switzerland, do come there. It's beautiful. Um, what we do more generally, just quickly, is uh, we are interested, that's very crudely depicted here, in the intersection between science and society. So uh, all the, bit, the major research foci that we have can be mapped kind of in this intersection. And what we basically do is, is three things, I think. The first one is what I have dubbed here the mediatization of science. And the basic question for us is here, well, how do media, and that not only means news media, or legacy media, or journalistic media, it also means online media and social media nowadays, how do media, or do media, and if so, how do media, change how science conducts research? And or how institutions of science, HEI means higher education institutions, uh, how they are structured, how they do their outreach communication. And that is something we do essentially on two levels. We've done a couple of projects on individual scientists, uh, inquiring, for example, about their media strategies, their media experiences, the question if they, if they uh, for example, let's say the post that you have seen on, on, on the previous slide, she's done research on the question if, uh, whether under certain circumstances uh, climate scientists are willing to exaggerate their findings when they communicate in public. And that's one of the questions that we have here. And we also do this on the level of organizations, of higher education institutions, of universities, looking into questions like, well, how have universities, research institutions, etc., changed their outreach communication in the past 20 years or so? Uh, how have they restructured resources? How have they restructured the organization? And what does that mean for how the organization actually looks like and how it works and how it functions? And what is, what is probably also dysfunctional about these restructurings? The second uh, research topic is very generally probably can be uh, 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 titled Science in the Public. What we do there is we analyze the characteristics of public debates about science or about science-related issues, and we look into the effects of these issues. And, and uh, Dominic has already said, uh, I've done quite a bit of work on communicating or how climate change, how global warming is uh, communicated, is portrayed in the media of different countries. We've done analysis, for example, where we analyzed how climate change is portrayed in 27 countries over the past 20 years and looked into, well, how important has the issue been, what has triggered extensive uh, 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 media coverage about the issue, and what are the effects of that. Um, and we do similar things on other issues like nuclear energy, biotechnology, etc. And what we also do, and I'm going to go a little more in depth on that later on, is the, the Wissenschaftsbarometer, the Science Barometer, Switzerland, where we uh, do survey work on the Swiss attitudes of and perceptions towards science, how they perceive science and where they get their information <coughs> about science. And the last point then is science online and science in social media. Uh, the media ecosystems uh, have changed, media landscapes have changed, uh, online media have become more important. We do a whole lot of work on that. We have looked, for example, on how digital-born journalistic players, like BuzzFeed, like the Huffington Post, like Vice, etc. Well, how do they actually cover science and environmental issues? And how far does do these, do, they, do these representations differ from other journalistic media? Is it something special that they do when they do immersive journalism and all that? We look into online controversies and their potential fragmentation, into things like, well, are there echo chambers? Are there, is there something like filter bubbles? Maybe not generally, around all news issues. That's where 
research nowadays would say, well, it's not a general phenomenon probably, but maybe, maybe it exists around a specific phenomenon, science, uh, around climate change, for example. We look into, uh, on the individual level, the skills that people need to make the best use of online media to get information about science. What are the skills, what are the competencies that people need to get the best information about science? Out of online media, and something that interests me as well is crowdfunding science as a new interface between science and society. That's something I'm interested in. So that essentially is the portfolio of what we do in terms of research. And what I would like to focus on today, as I said, is the Wissenschaftsbarometer, the Science Barometer Switzerland, which uh, is a project that we do since 2016. Oh, sorry. I don't know if you touch it. Ah, you said that. Like, yeah, it's, <laughs> everybody does. Don't worry. Sure. <laughs> um, and that's a, it's a, I'm not actually sure if that's a proper word. It's a triannual, I wrote, survey. <laughs> so we do it every three years. I'm not. Uh, it, as a survey of the Swiss population, we do every three years in all the linguistic regions. Switzerland is linguistically very diverse. So we Italian speaking, French speaking, German speaking, other uh, regions, we cover them all. We have uh, many questions that are identical to international surveys, like the Eurobarometer in, in European countries, or uh, some of them also to the science and engineering indicators from the National Science Foundation in the US. Um, and you find all the documentation and the questionnaires and everything under www.wissenschaftsbarometer.ch if you're interested. Um, and it's funded by two Swiss foundations. And the thing is that uh, we are quite pleased with the general support, and really general support that we get, uh, because it's coupled with a lot of freedom that we have for the surveys. We have a 20-minute survey that we can do representatively for three, for three waves, so for 2016, 2019, 2022. Uh, and so we could put a lot of the questions that interest us in there. And one of the questions that interested us, and that was actually the first paper that came out of this, the, the Wissenschaftsbarometer, the Science Barometer, was the an analysis of the different audiences of science communication in Switzerland, a segmentation analysis, and that's what I wanted to present to you today. So, first step, what did we do and why? What's the framework? What are the research questions that we, that we dealt with? Um, kind of the basic uh, uh, premise of the research is, well, science, science is important. Science is important because it's the source of the best available knowledge that we have for many decisions that we have to make on an individual level, on an organizational level, on a societal level. For many of the questions that, that uh, are prevalent there, science provides potential answers, and good answers, and potentially the best answers that we have. So it's an important societal institution to have. But it's an institution that operates in a conundrum. In a conundrum because on the one side it needs autonomy, it needs freedom, it needs room to breathe, to develop innovative ideas and all that. At the same time, it's dependent on societal support and on resources, on tax money, etc. So it's important how the public perceives science. And the public can be many things, it can be political decision makers, it can be stakeholders, and it can be the broader public, the general population, if you like. And that's one of the reasons why survey research uh, on the attitudes of perceptions of science by the broader public has been a prominent field of research in many countries. And if you look into this research, something you find again and again is that there's differences between certain people, between, for example, the socio-demographic groups in terms of how they perceive uh, science. Uh, general attitudes towards science differ for people with different education levels, for example, in many countries between urban and rural areas. <coughs> uh, attitudes towards specific issues like nanotechnology or, or animal ex uh, experimentation differ along different socioeconomic groups, etc., etc. And uh, that is interesting here because the variation that you find there, the variation of these perceptions, and that's a quote from, from Dalatai and others, it represents a significant challenge for scientists, policymakers, and others tasked with effective communication, as certain types of messages may be enthusiastically embraced by some members of the general public but elicit indifference or outrage from others. And our question is, well, could it be that there are segments of the population, of the Swiss population, or in our case, that can be distinguished uh, along their attitudes towards science? Segments that have homogeneous attitudes towards science that we can kind of reconstruct. First research question. 
And the second research question then is, I'm a communication scholar, at least several here in the room, uh, it's kind of our uh, deformation professionnelle. Uh, many people get their information about science from the media, that's something we know. And it's not only news media anymore, it's, it's different kinds of media, online media, etc. And at the same time, media use is not that often included in the same surveys that do work on attitudes towards science. Sometimes it is, but often it isn't. If it is, it often shows, again, that media use differs strongly among people who have interests in or different degrees of interest in science. So we, again, were interested in the question, well, if we can identify the segments, is it possible that they differ in their uh, patterns of media information use to one side? So that's the second research question. And the way in which we went about to answer that is segmentation analysis. Segmentation analysis very generally is an analysis that aims to divide the general public into relatively homogeneous, mutually exclusive subgroupings. So you have a population that has certain attitudes towards science and you try to figure out, well, are there typical, uh, uh, typical segments of the population that are homogeneous in how they see science and research. And we try to figure that out. And often that is done so that in the second step, appropriate message designs and communication strategies can be developed to influence attitudes and behaviors potentially. And that is done methodologically in different ways. You have uh, segmentation analysis that are based on qualitative interviews and focus group work. You have segmentation analysis based on standardized surveys. You have nowadays, especially, segmentation analysis based on social media analyses. Different approaches to how you actually segment the population. Um, but if you want to come up with something that's representative for the population of a given country or a, given, a state or whatever, quantitative surveys, representative quantitative surveys is something that Donald Hein and the others at least consider to be the gold standard there. That's also what we, what we used to do our segmentation analysis. And there's basically, uh, do I actually have to be quicker than, than I'm supposed to be? You have until one. So, All right. So, uh, but then, uh, if you leave a few minutes for questions, it would be great. I'll try to be quick where I can be. So this, just shortly, there's different ways of how you can do segmentation analysis. Um, the kind of the, the first way in which segmentation analysis were done is what I've called here sociodemographic segmentation analysis. Uh, populations were segmented along sociodemographic criteria, along education, race, income, gender, etc. And once you had these groups homogenous along sociodemographic criteria, you then cross tap them to see, well, what media do they use, what behaviors do they have? And the problem is, that's only interesting if the behaviors that you're interested in, or the attitudes, are strongly linked to sociodemographic criteria, <coughs> and often they are not. So what's been done often then, it's what, what uh, some people have called psychographic segmentation analysis, which, are, which segment along attitudes towards a given topic and then link these attitudinal groups, these attitudinal segments, to certain behaviors or certain uh, sociodemographics. That's been done in quite a few fields. The problem here is that the predictive power for behavior can be limited, because once you do this, you have groups who are homogeneous in their attitudes, but not necessarily homogeneous in the channels or the content of communication that they use, or in the behaviors that they do, because you have homogeneity in their attitudes and not in the other, other factors. And that's why the third approach has been behavioral segmentation analysis, who look for segments of the population who are similar in their behavior, who use the same media, who use the same content, who are buying the same products if it's, if it's about consumption. That's been used in marketing and advertising research. So what we did here, we actually did both, both of these, and I'll get back to that very shortly in the end. What I'm going to present you here is an analysis of these psychographic uh, segmentation analysis, that's what we did uh, here, partly also because our funders were interested in kind of, well, how does the, the population actually look like in their attitudes towards science and research. And just very quickly, there's not many analyses who do that out there already. Uh, certainly not where they focus on science communication, there's a few like, like you listed, Ezra Markowitz looking at biomedical research, but that's not that many. There's a couple more when you look at climate change communication and health communication. That's a field where that's been quite a, quite a prominent approach. And uh, 
again, there's only a few of these studies that also did not only look at attitudes, but that also look at media information patterns. So that's what has led us to our two research questions that I've already shown you. And uh, what we, the way we went about to this kind of segmentation then is we uh, used the uh, uh, criteria, the variables that other studies had proposed to be relevant to the segmentation psychographically. And we tried to mirror those for science communication and relied on the quite rich history by now on, of survey research on how science is perceived in different, in different uh, publics. So uh, we included, uh, I'll, I'll be short, we included the attitudes towards science, attitudes understood as the kind of the three pillar system of attitudes developed in social psychology. So we have a cognitive, an affective, and a cognitive behavior element of, of attitudes towards science that includes knowledge and interest in our understanding. For example, you have something like trust and relevance for personal life here. In cognitive, you have, for example, searching information about We included what's been called reservations and beliefs in the promise of science. That's something in the European <coughs> term it's used often. That includes items like, I think that eventually science is able to answer all the questions of the universe as well. Practically, literally, one of the items that is asked there. Or science, uh, uh, science changes our lives too quickly is one of the concerns, for example, that's also in there. And we have preferences regarding the relationship between science and society in there. For example, do you think that science should advise politics? And uh, to measure uh, patterns of information media use, we had a number of, of uh, variables from news media use, and online media use, from interpersonal communication, from other sources, potential sources of information about science, like going to zoos, going to museums, going to talks, etc. Uh, and we also had the motivations with which people approach these sources and the assessment of people towards these sources. Do I think that's a trustworthy source, etc., etc.? And we have sociodemographics as well. So that's kind of the. <coughs> The spectrum of the, of the factors that we factor in, into our uh, segmentation analysis. I'll be quick with the methodology and get back to that later if you have questions on that. It's based on the survey that we did. There's, there's two basic ways of how these segmentation analyses are mostly done. And I'll just skip that part. What we did is latent class analysis because that's a statistical method that's uh, that has a number of advantages that were important to us, so we used that. Um, used the 20 variables representing the, the, the constructs that I've just presented to you, and then uh, came up with a, I'll be quick here as well, came up with a solution that was a four cluster solution, so a four segment solution, if you like. Um, and that I won't explain. It looks nice, but I won't explain it. <laughs> <laughs> Should I? Are you interested? It's, uh, I'll, I'll quickly go back. One of the advantages of this LCA analysis is that you have all the variables. That's the 20 variables here, and that's the means of the four clusters. And if you do LCA, uh, the class analysis, the advantage is you can find out which of the variables are good in distinguishing between the four groups. So if you look at these, bad variables in that respect, because the, the clusters don't, or the, the segments have to be more, more precise, the segments don't really vary there, whereas these here, they're quite good, because they distinguish a lot. And that gives you the option, and that's something we've done, I'll show you again, that gives you the option of figuring out which variables you really need to distinguish between segments, so you can make the whole 20 variable version much shorter, if you want. Okay, the results. That's the shortest version. Of, of results. I'm not sure you see that, but I'll, I have some explainers there anyway. It's four segments that we've distinguished, and I'll quickly go through the characteristics of these segments first, only in terms of well, how do they see science. And it's everything that's in here, you will see in here as well. So that's the first book is what we've called the science files. Uh, similar to, there was one British study where they had the techno files, they were interested in any sort of technology, that's quite a similar group to what science files was. 
A quarter of the Swiss population, a group that associates science and research, if you ask them in an open question, mostly with natural sciences, medicine, and engineering. Although I have to say that it sounds trivial in the American ear, probably, because the term science in German Wissenschaft is not yeah. only, only associated with natural science. science. Wissenschaft in German means all the sciences, humanities, arts, it's all Wissenschaft. So if you ask people what do you associate with Wissenschaft, then they could say a lot of things, and actually 5% also said social science. It's 5% of these people. Uh, and they are the group with the most extensive knowledge about uh, science, the highest interest in it. They have very positive attitudes, so they very strongly agree with items uh, like science which improves our lives, the benefits are larger than the potential dangers. They have a very pronounced trust both in individual scientists and in science as a system. Um, and high hopes in the potential of science. It's, uh, you know, we find most support for, well, I think science can solve every problem. And science should inform politics, and I don't think there should be any restrictions. So a very, very positive uh, perception of science. And the other group up there, is a group we've labeled the critically interested, small group, 17% of the Swiss population, that has many similarities to the science files in, in, in some respects. Similar associations with science, they are very knowledgeable, very interested, they have very positive general attitudes towards science, but they have considerably less trust in science and scientists, especially in individual scientists. They have much more moderate hopes in terms of what science can do, can it explain all the questions of the universe? They would say, well, no, maybe not. And uh, they have clear concerns and also favor some restrictions. And they likely, but that's something we didn't really ask here, likely they also have clear concerns related to, to specific scientific issues, like uh, animal experimentation, etc., uh, etc., et CRISPR. Okay, for, uh, third group. The passive supporters, the largest group, 40% of the Swiss population, um, they are positive in their attitudes towards science and research. They think the benefits are larger than the dangers. They are generally supportive and share some hopes but also some concerns. They don't think science should be allowed to research every issue, for example. There should be some restriction. And then we have the disengaged, how we call them. That's a small one, it's 13%. That's the, the they are the group among whom we find the most respondents who have no association. If you ask them, well, what do you associate with Wissenschaft, they come out blank. Not all of them, but most, the, the, the largest, uh, quite a significant group among these 13%. They have the least knowledge, they have no interest, they have the lowest trust in science. They still, although marginally, favor basic research and public funding. But they also have, they have low hopes in the potential of science. They agree to items like, well, humanity re relies too much on science. Uh, they favor restrictions, and they don't want to be involved also. If you ask them, we have a, our citizen science question, for example, kind of the cognitive uh, element of, of attitudes towards science. Would you ever be interested in taking part in a research project? Was something like that was the question. They absolutely, they no not Okay, so that's kind of the, the, the first research question with these four attitudinal segments that we have here. And then for these attitudinal segments, you can look at different variables and kind of plot the means for these segments. I'm, I'm not going to go into that here. You can also do some tables. You can check for significant differences between the different groups. And then you can see, for example, that the science files that what you see here is the percentage of women in this group. The science files are a largely, it's, like it's mostly men, whereas the disengaged, it's mostly women. The, there's no real age difference, no significant age differences. In terms of education, you see a pattern that you will see a couple of times now. The first two groups, the science files, and the critically interested, they are uh, equal, there's no differences between them. And then the passive supporters and the disengaged are uh, 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 successively lower. And you have the same pattern. We had something, the proximity to science. Do you have something to do with science in your life? Are you scientists or relative scientists? Do you have to do with science in your professional life, etc., etc.? Similar pattern. 
And in terms of political orientation, the only thing that, that uh, uh, jumps out is that the critically interested are significantly more left than the other groups. And then you can do the same thing for, I don't know, jump over that, for media sources. And the first thing that you can see is public service broadcasting. Television and radio, they are kind of, they are the great equalizers in Switzerland. They are the media where you don't see differences between the segments when it comes to well, where do you get in contact with science and research. All of the segments get in contact with science and research via public service broadcasting. Good argument for public service broadcasting. Um, but if you look at newspaper and magazine news, science magazine news, online news, and we have this also in more detail, but that's kind of the aggregate categories here, you find the same pattern of intensive users here, and then it's, it goes down in the other, in the other uh, two segments. So this can be summed up pretty much like this. The science files are, they're mostly men, they have the highest education among the segments, they have a high proximity to science, and they are significantly the least religious group among the four. Um, they actively search for information about science and research using a broad repertoire of sources. They discuss science and research with family and friends. They use many online sources, but not very often Facebook, interestingly. And they evaluate, uh, evaluate media uh, uh, coverage of science positively. They find it trustworthy, they find it uh, understandable, etc. The critically interested are also highly educated, have also a high uh, proximity to science. They are significantly more liberal, left-leaning in their political uh, uh, orientation. They have pretty much the same patterns of information and media use, broad spectrum, strongly online, searching actively, etc., etc. But they evaluate media content more critically and are also <coughs> less attentive to it and use it <coughs> a little less often. You have the passive supporters with lower education levels, that's the only thing that <coughs> jumps out. And they're a group that does not look actively for science in media. They encounter media, but it's, they encounter media via their routine media use. They read the newspaper, they watch the evening news, and there they see it occasionally, but uh, it's not that they would be looking for it. And they also don't really talk about it with family and friends, and they have kind of a, a moderate evaluation of media content. And they disengage highest proportion of women, the lowest level of education, the largest personal and professional dif dis distance to science, they have very low motivations to look for science and research. They don't do that. And they have the fewest sources and contacts to actually get in touch with science and research. Uh, the only sources that they have that are on par with other segments are pub public service broadcasting, especially TV, and interestingly, Facebook. Um, and they are pretty critical towards media coverage. Okay, and that's, that brings me to my last two slides. Uh, first is kind of the summary that the four uh, uh, segments, uh, four, four audiences of, of uh, science communication in Switzerland. What we can do with this Wissenschaftsbarometer is have this in-depth look at the, at the different uh, uh, audiences of science communication in Switzerland. We found these four attitudinal groups. And we think that's something that science communication efforts should take into account. It's, that would be interesting to be taken into account. And actually, our funders, who are foundations that do fund practical science communication efforts, they do that. They have jumped on some of the things that we found out here. And our next steps are, first of all, uh, we are doing a follow-up qualitative study now. So we have, I don't have time for anecdotes. Um, <laughs> we have, uh, just very shortly, though, so you understand the logic. I had the idea we have these representative samples every three years, and it's different people every three years. But I thought, well, let's at least ask them one question in the end, where we ask them, could we potentially uh, ask you again in three years? And if so, give us your contact details. And I thought, then 20% of the people will give us our contact details, and if we address them three years later, we'll get a response from very, very few of them. But the surprise was, in Switzerland, 80% of the people gave us their contact oh, details. Wow. So for 80% of the people, we have contacts. And what we did for this qualitative study is we knew to which of the segments people belong in our sample. So we chose 12 from each of the four groups and asked them to do a, a, a smartphone-based media diary for us uh, where they, for a week, 
they, uh, uh, ideally at least, they take pictures or small notes uh, where science, uh, where, where they encounter science and research in their everyday life. And they get reminded by messages from us every day. And afterwards, we do interviews with them. So what we want to find out here is, and that's kind of, it's ever known today, what we do there, that's out of the, out of the diaries that they keep. Um, so we want to find out a little bit more. I mean, it's quantitative. It's a standardized survey, what I've shown you. It, it has its limits. It has its merits, of course, but it has its limits as well. So we want to find out in more detail, well, what do they actually consider to be science, for example? Or what sometimes, and maybe that some of the groups that we, that we uh, found think that things are science that we probably wouldn't consider science. Um, so that, that's one of the next things. <coughs> we did already develop and test a short prediction instrument for these segments that I've shown you. So kind of shortened this 20 variable version. Uh, and that's something that's, that just came out a couple of weeks back. We, did a behavioral, that was the third version of segmentation analysis. So we did a segmentation analysis where we didn't segment the population according to their attitudes towards science, but to, to according to the media that they use to get in contact with science and research. And that's also something that's, that's just come out. We communicate our results to the public. We have this little brochure that I uh, forgot to bring, but it would have only been in German and French anyway. Uh, but you'll find it's online at least. And uh, we'll do this, we'll, we want to track trends in these segments over time also. And we can do that because the science barometer Switzerland continues in 2019 and 2022, ideally at least until I retire. Which I will do now for here. Thank you for your attention, and uh, <coughs> I left some time for QA. <laughs> Thank you.